Okay, we, we're, recording. we're recording. This is live. I love it. This is David Liggett with the Data Center Hawk podcast number five. Uh, so wherever you are listening from, we are very excited that you're joining us. Um, We have taken a brief break, but we're back and uh, just really excited. And so if you're new to this podcast and what we're doing, we want to to welcome you. And uh, we're across multiple different social channels, and uh, we film this as well. So there's a number of opportunities to to watch and participate uh, in our podcast content. Uh, I'm really excited uh, just about, you know, just in general about where the industry is right now. This is... Uh, we're kind of right at the end of the first quarter of 2019. A lot of uh, very exciting things happened in 2018 uh, in this industry. And um, and so it's just really fun to think about the next 12 months and, and what's going to happen. Um, one of the things we like to do on our podcast consistently is we talk about uh, data center market growth and where areas, geographic areas are growing and why they're growing. Uh, and so we like to spotlight one uh, data center market every time we do our Hawk podcast. And so uh, today we are going to feature the great market of Phoenix. So we're going to be talking about the Phoenix data center market, why it's growing, why it's changing. Uh, there's a lot of things that have happened there in the last uh, 24 months that I think are really um, interesting and changing that market uh, as we speak. Um, and then for those, actually, for those that don't know, uh, the data center Hawk platform is one where we um, grab information on the data center market. We've created different tools and technologies that allow, you know, a data center user, a data center investor, a, an owner, a provider, a, a consultant to actually log in and, and get information to help them make better decisions. And so a lot of this information is actually from that. Uh, and, you know, as I'm talking about Phoenix, uh, it's, you know, through the work that we've done, um, you know, analyzing that market, trying to understand why it's growing, where it's growing, uh, and how that's impacting uh, the overall data center landscape. And so I uh, just want to hit some quick notes about uh, Phoenix as a whole. And then uh, and then today we're also going to talk about enterprise users. And these are, you know, traditionally Fortune 1000 companies that have uh, a sizable data center infrastructure needs that aren't necessarily in this hyperscale category, which is, uh, if you know anything about the data center industry, it's what has uh, change the market over the last three years. If you don't know much about the data center industry, these are large companies, and I'm going to speak about it in a little bit, but, you know, like a Facebook or a, a Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, that have very large IT requirements, uh, and those those have really changed the, the industry. And so, um, but specifically as it is related to Phoenix, you know, one of the, one of the most interesting things about Phoenix in the last – I would say 12 months has really, uh, you know, started to uh, see five. We've really started to see five distinct development areas. And some of these have been around for a while, you know, like central Phoenix, downtown Phoenix. Uh, you know, there's been some really core connected buildings, uh, data center buildings that have been down there for, you know, 10, 15 years that have really set the market uh, as it relates to, uh, you know, data centers being built in the suburbs and then actually connecting back to that downtown core. But but there's a, there's really that downtown Phoenix. That's one area. You have uh, an area in North Phoenix that's really started to uh, develop. And, and a lot of that is from uh, a couple data center facilities that have been there for a while, but also um, Aligned Energy is there. They have a, a, a large facility there and um, are doing a lot of work there. So you have, you have downtown Phoenix, you have North Phoenix, you have uh, Chandler, which over the past five to seven years has seen much of the, the Phoenix data center market growth uh, as it relates to large users uh, wanting to be in a place where they can grow. And they've done that effectively through several data center operators in that market. Um, a lot of activity has been made about the Mesa, uh, Arizona area. And this is actually on the uh, east side of the Phoenix kind of metroplex and and has seen you know a number of data center operators actually purchase land and there's one actually building there we'll talk about that in a second and then 
as of kind of first quarter, middle of last year, and then first quarter 2019, Goodyear, Arizona. Uh, and so that is actually uh, on the west side of the Phoenix market. And so those are really the five distinct development areas in Phoenix, really that, that core central Phoenix, North Phoenix, Chandler, Mesa, and Goodyear. And that's where we're seeing the data center development today. I think one of the most significant things that's happened in the last 24 months related to activity in the data center market in Phoenix has been the the number of data center operators that have actually entered the Phoenix market by buying land or expanding if they've already been there. Now, now one thing that's really important uh, to make note of when you hear about you know, land being purchased in the data center industry is it just because land is purchased does not mean that development is is beginning right then. So, uh, one term that we hear a lot of right now in the data center industry is land banking, um, and so that is data center operators that are buying land to be in a position to actually uh, facilitate the demand moving forward. And we're seeing you know that happen in areas like Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia is the largest data center market. Uh, in the world, uh, but we're seeing it happen in areas like Phoenix and Dallas, Chicago, Silicon Valley, Atlanta, really all across the, the U.S. And then and then areas like uh, Canada, you know, Toronto, Montreal, uh, and then you know international markets as well. Uh, but we have definitely seen that in Phoenix in the last 24 months. So what I want to do is read through probably eight or nine different examples of data center operators that have purchased land or expanded in that market since, I guess, for about the last year and a half or two years. Uh, so in 4Q 2017, QTS bought land in Central Phoenix. That's one of the areas that we talked about. Um, and they're, they'll build on that, you know, one day when they're ready. 1Q 2018, Edgecore bought land in Mesa, and they're currently under construction with their first facility in that market. And so, again, this is on the east side of Phoenix. Uh, 1Q 2018, Edge Connects bought land in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, there's a couple of other data center operators that already own land out there. First quarter 2018, Align Data Centers, which is in the North Phoenix geographic area, uh, began expanding their campus, and uh, and they have invested heavily in that market. Uh, second quarter 2018, one of the largest data center operators in Phoenix, Cyrus One, actually bought additional land in Mesa. Uh, and this is in addition to, to the, the massive amount of work they've been doing in Chandler, Arizona, which their campus there is is very large. Uh, and 3Q 2018, Iron Mountain started construction in central Phoenix with a new facility. And this was a facility uh, area that they had, they had purchased IO's uh, data center portfolio. And so this new site is actually right next to the uh, kind of core Phoenix uh, Iron Mountain facility. Uh, and then in, in third quarter 2018, Microsoft bought a pretty sizable portion of land in Goodyear, Arizona. Uh, they're obviously a data center user, but they will build, own, and operate data center facilities on their own. First quarter 2019, Vantage Data Centers uh, bought land in Goodyear, Arizona. First quarter 2019, uh, Stream Data Centers bought land in Goodyear, Arizona. Uh, that has actually a, a shell facility on it today. There's some other data center operators that are looking in that market today. So you've just, you know, other than Northern Virginia, and this is just off the top of my head, but I don't think there's been any other market that's seen the amount of new entrants uh, to the market like Phoenix has. So I think that's just a really good takeaway about activity. Um, that doesn't mean all those data center operators are breaking ground today. That does not mean they uh, will deliver their capacity in that market in, you know, the next year or anything like that. But I think what it shows is that, you know, they are bullish on where that market is headed. And, you know, they're talking to end users themselves that find that market as one that they'd like to be in. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that kind of leads me to my next point, which is, you know, what is the demand in areas like Phoenix for users and who who is actually going there? You know, you have large hyperscale companies, which I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, enterprise users, so, you know, Fortune 500 companies have found that market to be attractive for their data center, IT infrastructure, technology companies, insurance companies, um, all have seen that market to be one that's, um, you know, that's attractive from a data center user perspective. There's two distinct power providers in 
uh, Phoenix. You have SRP, which is the Salt River Project. Uh, you also have APS, which is Arizona Public Service Electric Company. And the power cost for data center users in, in Phoenix traditionally is between six and seven cents, which is pretty reasonable for where uh, other markets are today. Uh, it does have a geographic benefit that it's close to California, but not in California. Uh, so some of the challenges that can be um, seen in the California market, you know, either Los Angeles or uh, Silicon Valley, and that might be with just the expense, you know, the, the high power cost, um, you know, rental rates and things like that. Um, you know, it's potentially it's obviously seen as a lower disaster area risk than than California. So um, it definitely receives interest as being close to California, but not in California. Um, and it also has a really good tax incentive story. So if you think about what data center users are looking at, depending on their size, as deal drivers, what's what's leading them to certain geographic areas. One of the biggest things, especially if you're a very large user, is what type of tax incentives you can get uh, to um, you know be offset uh, as it relates to the amount of money you're spending on your uh, IT uh, spend. And so a lot of that is the sales tax uh, on the IT equipment. But I think one of the things that's really interesting about Phoenix uh, is that you know, not only do the tax incentives apply to large data center users, but they can also apply to users as small as as 500 kW as it relates to their power infrastructure. There are some different requirements and characteristics around that, but that's that's a really important note um, because traditionally the tax incentives that are that have been offered to um, data center users have been really aimed at very large companies with very large requirements. But there are other enterprise type companies that have smaller yet sizable requirements that traditionally haven't been able to benefit from the tax incentives that have been offered in a state or a local municipality. And I think what we're seeing now is states and, uh, you know, governments starting to get smarter with how can we also benefit the company that 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 does have a, a sizable requirement. It might not be as big as you know, 10 megawatts or 20 megawatts, but it is still a sizable requirement. And that's something that Phoenix, um, you know, has the ability to do today. And, and I really think that, um, you know, 2019 in that market will be really interesting to watch. It's interesting to see how the the market is growing into different areas geographically. Um, so I think that's a really interesting, you know, thing to watch. I think just the amount of absorption that takes place um, so, you know, just Phoenix as a whole, and I'm actually getting on the, our data center hook platform right now. It's, it's a 223 megawatt market from a multi-tenant data center perspective. It has a very low vacancy rate. Uh, the 4Q 2018 vacancy rate was around 4%. Um, so there's been limited supply in the market. It's one of the reasons you've seen so many data center operators um, head that way. And, you know, traditionally the absorption in 2018 was, you know, around 25 megawatts. So what that means, if, if you're not in the data center space or you're not in it every day, like we are, that the absorption is just trying to tell people how much of the supply was taken up in a certain period of time. And so it's, it's a helpful metric for people to measure demand in the market. And, uh, and so we do that by the amount of power that people lease uh, in the data center space. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating market. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, 223 megawatts in 4Q 2018 started 1Q 2018, uh, with 200 megawatts. So it's definitely growing with the amount of infrastructure that's being added. And, uh, 2019 should be really fun to watch in Phoenix. So, um, we, we like to do that just to give our listeners overviews of specific markets. Not every, uh, one has a, a Phoenix requirement or has, you know, a data center in Phoenix. But I think it's important to understand kind of how the the different data center markets are um, similar and different from one another. You know, one of the things that is interesting about the data center space as a whole is that traditionally you're going to, um, if, if you're trying to geographically figure out where you want to go, Sometimes the, the discussion is not necessarily within the current city that you're in. It's, it's city to city. So it's kind of finding a region and then understanding the different 
the, the, the advantages and disadvantages of certain markets based off of what region or area that you want to be. Certainly there is the uh, you know, discussion of where to go in a specific market, but it's also understanding one market versus the other. And so Phoenix has a number of, of uh, positive and interesting characteristics that are, are growing the market today. Um, so one of the trends that we've seen in Phoenix and across the industry as a whole is that hyperscale demand has dominated the space for the last, what I'd say, 24 months. And so what that means is, you know, companies, major cloud providers, when we say hyperscale demand, that's major cloud providers, software as a service companies, uh, internet and social media companies have had very large requirements. And so those requirements have actually been um, placed into large co-location facilities in markets across the U.S., across Canada, across uh, Europe, starting to be uh, into the Asia-Pac region. And, you know, that's definitely a trend that I think the, the industry as a whole believes will continue. But um, a lot of times I get asked, you know, what is that demand? And actually, I found a, 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 a document this week that I thought was a really good overview of that. It's this pretty, I don't know if this camera will get it, this one right here. But it's um, it's a good little overview of how how we use the internet and a lot, a lot through some of these, not only just social media companies, but also larger um, cloud companies as well. So I thought I would read a couple of these that I thought were actually fascinating. Um, so, and this was actually created by um, Lori Lewis or at Lori Lewis on Twitter. You can check uh, that out there. So if you want the actual document, you can go to uh, that. But, but she put together something that was 2019. This is what happens in an internet minute. So every 60 seconds, th these things are happening uh, on the Internet. So on, on Facebook, uh, there's one million people logging in every minute. Fascinating. Um, on Google, there's 3.8 million search queries every minute. Um, there is almost a million dollars being spent online every minute. Uh, there are 18.1 million texts sent every minute. Rhett, how about that? Uh, on YouTube, there is four and a half million videos viewed every minute. Uh, Instagram, so if you're a big Instagram fan, every minute there are over, I guess, 350,000 people scrolling Instagram every minute, which is just it's crazy. So um, that's happening. 87,500 people are tweeting every minute. Uh, this is interesting on Netflix. You know who you are if you watch some Netflix. So last year this is there's actually a 2018 document of this and last year it was like 266,000 um you know people were watching Netflix every minute this year 700,000 so quite a jump i'm not sure if that's a good, i'm not sure that says good things about us as a society or or bad things no offense to Netflix but uh, and there's over 390,000 apps downloaded every minute. Anyway, so just fascinating. So it's so we get questions a lot about, hey, you know, so, some questions are what are data centers to people that don't understand. And but but this is it's it's this type of use that is fueling this industry and it's really changing. And, and it's caused, you know, just massive growth in uh, different markets and all of these all this computing power. Uh, depending on what type of, of application it's in, all of it goes into actual like a, a building, a facility, and it has to be on a server. And so those servers are in, a, are in areas like Phoenix. They're in areas like Dallas, Chicago, Northern Virginia, Atlanta, Seattle, Hillsboro, uh, Oregon, um, Northern California. And so as an example, so, so the biggest data center market um, in the world is in Northern Virginia. And so I, I actually pulled up on, on Data Center Hawk the amount of absorption that's taken place in the last three years. Or 2016, um, Northern Virginia absorbed 120 megawatts during that year. 2017, 124 megawatts. And in 2018, 294 megawatts. So there's a massive jump, uh, you know, if you think about from 2016, which actually just let me tell everybody like 120 megawatts. That's that was a record then, and it and obviously 294 in 2018 is a record now. Um, but what I think this this illustrates is is much of this demand was tied to 
large hyperscale companies that were doing certain things. But what is still out there, and it's still a, a, a user group that is active in the market, are enterprise users. And so what I wanted to do today was just try and highlight uh, those enterprise users and some of the things that they're thinking about today. Because these are still, you know, typically these are Fortune 1000, 2000 companies that have, you know, very sizable, um, predictable IT infrastructure requirements that that aren't going to go into owned and operated facilities that they have. And traditionally, they don't fully get deployed to cloud. Sometimes they do, but we've seen, um, you know, somewhat of a, a combined approach with a number of different things. And so what I want to do today is, is highlight uh, some of those things. Uh, some of the things that are important to those enterprise data center users and really where we've seen uh, those change. Uh, I actually spent the last few days talking to a number of different groups that help serve companies that are looking for this IT infrastructure, not just consult with them, but also data center operators that have these companies as customers and actually a few of the, the companies themselves. And said, hey, what are the most important things to you as you think about how we want to move forward with our IT infrastructure. And these were these were four things that I took away from those conversations. And, and I want to make a, a just an important to note on the front end. Um, economics are really important. It's not one of the things I'm going to talk about, but, but economics are extremely important in uh, any type of, you know, company's uh, goal to make their IT infrastructure more efficient. You have to look at pricing. You have to look at cost. You have to understand the different metrics and how they change. Um, but I just, you know, they play a big part in all these decisions, but they're not the only part. And I think that companies that get caught up in, we need to the most inexpensive solution, um, you know, you just because it's the cheapest solution doesn't mean it's the best solution. And, and there's different times you, you get what you pay for most of the time. So I, th I think that's an important thing to note that economics should be considered, budgets should be followed and looked at, but sometimes the the most inexpensive solution is not the best solution. So when we talk to enterprise data center users and people that are serving them in the market, here are the four things that we came away with that they really are focused on. Um, and then the first thing is just flexible solutions as a whole. You know, one of the greatest needs that we've seen data center users have is flexibility, especially these, you know, Fortune 1000 companies. It, it, it doesn't matter if you have, if those companies have needs of one cabinet, 10 cabinets, 100 cabinets, 1,000, you know, 100 kW, 10 kW, or a megawatt, depending on whatever that size range is. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, even what type of company it is, financial companies, healthcare companies, technology companies, insurance, professional services, you know, what matters is the company's ability to have flexibility in things like their contract, uh, their services, their spend. And actually, the spend flexibility is, is interesting. I think it's worth noting today. Um, you know, one of the things that we hear more and more of from the data center operator community is contract uh, portability, spend portability. And I think it speaks to, uh, and, and I, you know, give the data center operator community credit for this. I think it speaks to their desire to allow their customers to have an ease of doing business method um, so that they can more easily utilize the services and the opportunities to, uh, that data center operators provide today. Um, you know, and that's where the actual spend that the customer is making is flexible. So, um, you know, figuring that out, deploying that architecture, uh, moving those applications around obviously takes work, but but the spend can be flexible. And I think the data center, oper data center operator community um, has provided data center users an ability to change as time moves on. And it's, you know, it's challenging to be a data center user today because of the different changes, which we'll talk about in a minute. But flexibility for the data center user is is key uh, for them and those enterprise data center users to grow the way they need to. Um, you know, another item that we hear from enterprise data center users today is, is future-proofed solutions. You know, one of the continuous challenges that enterprise users face is dealing with the unknown. And, you know, the unknown as it relates to technology, how it will change specifically how it changes hardware and software, how those changes will impact their business. These are like, these are real questions that 
companies have to answer it groups within organizations have to answer chief financial officers you know have to understand what those costs will be uh and so any change within that is it can be challenging uh you know the unknown is as it relates to their business is is hard you know that if they acquire a company in the next year how they grow or decline in their size how they deliver new business applications that change the course of their their infrastructure so all that unknown gets flushed out through the IT infrastructure in some way or another and so the ability to future proof your solution is um, highly important for data center users today and and that's not the, there's a number of ways to do that and I think that data center operators today it doesn't matter what market you're in doesn't matter if you're in the US or Europe I think those companies are really the, the data center operators are really trying to focus on how to help customers do this not just by how we build these facilities but how we add services that can help you today or down the road and they're really working to transform their method of service to be much more uh, full scoped uh, so flexible solutions future proof solutions uh, another thing that we see today are higher density solutions for the enterprise user community so you know one of the most noticeable differences that that i see when and our company sees when we're walking through different data center facilities are uh the change in environment density you know back when i started in this space and was you know seeing data center infrastructure and how it was built and and the servers and actually how much power could go into those servers you know traditionally was in the two to four kw amount of power per cabinet um and now that's that's really changed and and it and it's not just it's a it's a mindset difference i mean there's there's some operational advantages if you can shrink your footprint do some different things but but the, but to take a company an enterprise company that's that's done things a certain way for a certain period of time and 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 change that uh, is a big deal. And, you know, bigger companies, it's, it can be harder to change the way they've always done things. Plus, those individuals that are making that change are really putting their jobs on the line because if IT infrastructure goes down, they are the ones that are responsible. So, you know, it's it's an easy trend to spot with really big, sophisticated data center users that are doing this all the time that in their past, they've actually built, owned and operated data center facilities themselves. So they're they're pretty sophisticated in how they deploy their IT infrastructure, but it's been really interesting to watch the the uh, enterprise user community focus on that and really deliver that. And you know, there's been things that have been helpful. How data centers are being built today, um, you know, there's different types of cooling technology that's made this easier. But we certainly see this as something that will will grow in the future. And and, you know, there's there's different types of if you're deep into the space and you're listening to this, you're going, oh, David, what about, you know, uh, cabinets that can get 30 kW and, and higher than that? Obviously, there are those type of of uh, of densities and, and, and those are those are increasing. But I think, you know, I think on the enterprise level, we're trying to point out really a difference between the two to four kW to the five to ten and really getting to that kind of next summit of of uh, data center IT infrastructure and, and the density uh, there. So again, flexible solutions, future-proof solutions, higher density solutions, and then additional services. Uh, you know, we are definitely see, seeing be something that enterprise users are looking for the data center operator to help them with. Um, it it kind of goes back to the unknown a bit, but I think generally and and you know if you're a data center operator to, today i would say agree or disagree uh, but they want more than just a power space and cooling solution that is obviously expected to work well you've put service level agreements around that uh, most of the time i'm knocking on wood for all data center operators out there but you know your infrastructure is built in a way that it does not go down you have redundancies at the ups the generator the cooling systems um, the network to make sure that things stay up and so uh now they are looking for they have additional problems and they want those problems to be solved and and you know we have seen the the data center user community really work to to try and help fix those. So, so here are some of the ways that we've we've seen that, and the data center users are really reaching out to 
uh, data center operators to fix those challenges. You know, one is is just managed services, additional services on top of you know the the power space and cooling that's provided. Some data center operators provide that in house. Some work with partners, but you you can't just leave that to the the enterprise user. You have to uh, they are they are pressing for hey we we need a pathway not only today but down the road if we need these services how are we going to solve them if we are you know committing to be in this facility or in this relationship for five seven ten years uh, and I. I think too around that discussion, um, you know, data center operators have have worked to to try and do that, to try and provide a uh, a pathway of growth in the future. It's important for data center users to recognize if you're a company that's looking to um, you know extend your IT infrastructure footprint with uh, a data center operator. Those relationships typically last a long time, so you need to be comfortable with the fact that you're. Uh, you're synced up with someone that you trust and, you know, will you can roll with for a while. Um, so the managed services part is definitely something that data center users are looking to, to uh, ex- expand and extend. You know, we're seeing network issues um, become more and more important for the mature data center user as companies have recognized how important their network is and how important it working correctly is for their business. Um, how they architect their solution and, and who they choose to do that with and in what facilities and what are the challenges and costs behind all of that architecture. Um, that's really important. And so, you know, it seems like the data center, the enterprise data center user community is now really asking data center providers to help re-architect their network. And that's a huge opportunity um, in the space today. And so when you think about the way companies have set up their network application years ago, a lot has changed you know, the Internet of Things showed up. Um, heavy data usage is taking place today, and, and because of certain application delivery uh, might have increased in a way companies didn't anticipate. And so when companies are in a situation where they are uh, moving that uh, or refreshing hardware um, and refocusing and re-architecting things, the network plays a big part in that. And they are looking to data center operators to be helpful in that process. Um, and I can think of, you know, literally five, ten examples off the top of my head that that show where a company is really asking the data center operator the questions about how can you help me improve our network our network architecture. Um, and then another service that you know we're seeing, which is you you certainly have seen this communicated in the market, is just cloud connectivity, and not necessarily even for today, but how. How can you connect me in the future? And so that's been that's been really interesting to watch because traditionally, um, you know, there wasn't the thought around, hey, how can we get someone to all these different, um, you know, on the fiber side, how can we get someone to all these fiber providers? That, you know, Carrier Hotel allows you to do that. But on the cloud side, there wasn't. And so now there are some really interesting options as it relates to not just your ability to direct connect to, you know, the three biggest cloud providers, AWS, uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft, but also to, you know, many other cloud providers through additional services like Megaport and others. And so, um, you know, that is a need that the data center enterprise community is trying to figure out and they have today and they're looking to data center operators to be helpful in that. I just think that the enterprise user base is is still a really interesting market to focus on. Um, you know, if you think about the way companies are growing, the way companies are using technology, the way they're looking for like a mix up of a hybrid approach of, you know, public and private cloud, you know, with co-location offerings, with network re-architected, with additional services that might uh, become needed down the road. It's 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 a fascinating user group. And I think 2019 will be really interesting because of some of the growth that we're seeing in cloud and some of the, the changes that's, that is uh, causing for enterprise users as well as data center operators. So, um, so that's it. So, you know, th- if you're thinking about enterprise data center users today and some of the needs they have, again, flexible solutions, future-proof solutions, higher density solutions, and additional services. That's really where we're seeing them 
uh, spend their time in talking with data center operators and really setting up their infrastructure. Um, so that's it. That's a lot of David Liggett talking about the data center industry, but um, but we're really excited. So uh, just to be you know back on our podcast, if you want to learn more about the space, uh, the data center industry as a whole, you can get on our website. It's datacenterhawk.com. Uh, we have a search platform there, a research platform, a deal platform. It's all designed to help data center users, providers, investors, consultants find uh, information about the data center industry faster. Uh, so, you know, jump on there. Uh, if you're looking to connect with us, um, you know, you can do that. You can find us on social media. Um, you know, we're on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. I'd love to say that was off the top of my head, but I did have some notes to help me. But, uh, you know, we do have a, like, our, our podcast is on, you, know, you can find it on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. And then we've got some great content on YouTube as well. We do interviews with data center uh, leaders in the space and just get their, their input on what's happening in the market. And so we've got additional ones of those coming. So we're really excited about that. So thanks for listening wherever you are. Um, you know, very excited that you joined us today and look forward to having you on the next one. So long.